here we are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art looking at an early Byzantine marble bust. And she's almost life-size. I feel like I'm looking just about eye to eye with her. She seems to be pursing her lips, her eyes gaze outward at the viewer, and you almost have a sense of this historical person who really existed, uh, who had her likeness carved into marble. Exactly, and I want to know more about her. I just have to look for clues. Like I see she's holding a scroll in her hand. The scroll is, a, it's a subtle detail that we might easily overlook today, uh, but in the ancient and medieval world, it was a very clear indicator of literacy, of learning, uh, that this woman could read, could write, Right, and she was an intellectual of her time, no doubt. And it's a marker that you more often see in male public depictions. But going back to images of the muses like Polymnia, we start seeing depictions of women holding it. So that clearly is a powerful statement. But what I'm also looking at is she's wearing aristocratic clothing. She has the tunic with the elegant drape of a mantle. And what's that on her head? We can see that her hair has been put up in a very precise and deliberate way, and it's been covered, and it seems to have been covered with perhaps uh, silk or a similar very delicate material because the sculptor has actually indicated um, the, the folds and the arrangement of her hair underneath. Right, so it would have been this very elegant hairstyle with these thick braids that coiled around and it's all hinted at under this. So while clearly she needed to cover her hair or wanted to cover her hair, that's a matter of debate. Maybe it represents the ascent of a new norm of Christian modesty that was coming into society at the time because other depictions of women certainly have their hair covered from this period in Byzantium. But there's a tension too because it's clearly a very diaphanous cover and so we can see she has this beautifully abundant hair as well underneath. What we see here is really a restrained sophistication. Uh, she's not wearing decadent jewels or, or a diadem as Byzantine empresses will start to wear in subsequent centuries, but she's clearly a woman of means and cultivation. I'm intrigued by how this would have appeared in public space. What would this have been used as? So like when we look at the sculpture, one of the disconcerting aspects is she's missing her right shoulder. Did this sculpture initially adorn a wall, for example, and fall down? And looking over at the side, I can see it's a very tidy, sawed edge. And we can see her nose has been damaged as well. So clearly the sculpture has not come down to us uh, as it was originally created. But the parts that remain are in beautiful condition. You know, we have overall just a few minor chips and there's some incrustations, but the marble is luminous. And we have this beautifully formed face with rather full cheeks, these almond-shaped eyes and deeply drilled pupils. And those holes in the eyes once probably contained pieces of glass, which would have uh, given the impression of pupils and irises and would have given this sculpture an even more lifelike feel. Her clothing probably was painted uh, in colors as well as ancient and medieval sculpture usually was. While we have this sense of very vivid presence and in many ways it kind of alludes to classical art and its naturalism and uh, some of the classical conventions such as holding the scroll, we also see the beginnings of medieval abstraction. So from an art historical point of view, it's really at a crossroads. It's this moment of transition between the Roman world with its great tradition of portraiture, uh, and we have so many surviving Roman portraits which are incredibly realistic, and incredibly individualized, and this emerging uh, Byzantine world uh, which endures through the Middle Ages and which we come to associate with icons, with their gold leaf and, and the wide-eyed holy figures staring out at us. Now, there are other details that we probably will never know the answer to, such as was this originally part of an ensemble? She seems to be turning ever so slightly to the right. Uh, earlier scholars suggested that maybe she was a pair, so it was a husband and wife funerary pair, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. We don't have any extant examples of sculpture like that from this period, so perhaps it was more of an ensemble in a public space where various important personages were displayed. I think there's indication that there was a remainder of a pole attached to the back, so maybe it was attached to a wall, it fell, was then repaired. 
There are any number of scenarios we can conjecture. Three-dimensional sculptures of women have a long history in the Roman Empire. Such sculptures appeared in public spaces uh, of important women, imperial women and important women who played a role in building and dedicating public spaces. They appeared in funeral contexts and they even appeared in domestic contexts. Absolutely. So all together we have this figure that renders a compelling image of an elite woman from this time that both is anchored in classical naturalism but points in very significant ways towards developments that will deepen as the Byzantine period proceeds.